once they're at home. So we have four coordinators that are joining us. Um, we have Catherine Abernathy from VCU. She'll be presenting the C2 to Freedom Conversion. Thank you, Catherine. Um, next will be followed by Shauna Andrus. Hi, Shauna from University of Washington. She's the lead VAG coordinator, MCS coordinator, lung donor coordinator up there. We have Mel Runyon, the assistant nurse manager of the MCS Artificial Heart VAD program at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. Thank you, Mel, for being here. And um, Amanda Bolton from, excuse me, from the, uh, she's an artificial heart and MCS coordinator at Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix. Hi, everyone. So, uh, 10 minutes per person. And yeah, go ahead. Rabia, are you going to also speak for Banner? I'm going to be gonna presenting. Be presenting. Okay. okay, Rubaya from Banner Hospital in Phoenix. I'll act like I'll Amanda, act though. Like Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Very good. Um, it's about 10 minutes per person. The goal of this is to show you what some of the tips and tricks are, but really to engage you in where the gaps are. You know, I don't know about you, having been a coordinator in my past life, it was never until I was in the middle of it or the throes of it um, where what I didn't know came to haunt me very quickly. So this is really what this is about, is getting those questions answered. Um, with that, I uh, request that you, if you have any questions, I'll moderate and I'll field them from the chat if at all possible so that we can keep our time relatively on time. So plan on at least 40 minutes. Okay, Catherine, it's all yours. Go ahead and share away. All right. Are y'all going to share my slides or do you want me to? You can go, you can share yours. Go ahead. Let's see. Let's see if that works. Can y'all see that? Yep, you got it. Okay. Um, all right, I can't get it in the, okay, we'll go from this way. So I'm just gonna present the basic steps um, here um, that we use and consider when uh, transitioning our patients from C2 um, to our freedom. Um, majority of the time we're looking at these patients as we stated earlier uh, for discharge home with our freedom uh, we have a so some of our um, preparation uh, we do want to ensure they're obviously clinically stable um, they are on our progressive care unit when we do the transition um, with no expected planned procedures and we are as i stated preparing for discharge home uh, we have had a couple cases where for certain reasons we aren't able to discharge um, either after the transition uh, for multiple reasons or um, some clinical case that we've kept with us but we did do the transition still it just allowed them um, easier mobility in hospital um, so we do, it, our patients are under the surgery service, um, our surgeon guides in collaboration with the VAD team um, in transition readiness, um, considering our clinical picture, their blood pressure, their volume status um, over the last uh, days, weeks, um, and walk, monitoring our labs, specifically looking at, you know, LDs and, and such. Um, we do also want to ensure that our C2 settings um, mimic those ranges that our freedom drivers are at so that we're not too off um, when we are looking at transitioning. Um, the actual process of transitioning, we do have a good team set up um, when we're looking at doing this. The VAG coordinator is the lead when we're um, in the process. Um, our sur we have a surgery team provider, usually the APP present, um, as well as our bedside nurses, nurse or nurses. Um, again, you'll hear me say multiple times that we, whatever opportunities we have for education, um, we use those, whether that be for staff or for patient and family. Um, so therefore we do 
offer um, family to be present, the primary caregiver specifically, for the transition if they're interested to allow them to see that switch because sometimes that can be um, kind of hairy and um, anxiety provoking when we're talking about education with them. Um, and then we do, if there's room and space, we do offer that other staff be present if they're interested in learning um, and seeing if the patient, of course, is willing um, for those people to also be present, kind of out of the way, but observing. Um, so the actual process, I mentioned those who are present, um, but so the, the equipment, our discharge kit, um, once it does arrive on site, it is checked in by biomed personnel um, prior to our transition um, that we have scheduled. We do schedule the day and um, time even with the team that I mentioned is present um, so that everyone's prepared. Um, and of course, we've had times where we've scheduled them and then delayed it um, based off of um, some clinical factors with the patient that they're just not ready. Um, so then we reschedule. Uh, we as the coordinators will prepare all the individual pieces outside of the room and tote those in, programming the beat rates as appropriate. Um, and then uh, we will set up inside in the room. Um, we of course educate the patient and anyone there what is expected um, with the potential alarms and such that may occur um, in walking them through the steps as we are doing them. Um, we do do pre-vitals and just uh, grab a snapshot of what our um, driver settings or, or parameters are looking prior to the transition. Um, upon completion, um, we do allow the bedside nurse or nurses um, to do that transition either with us or with us just present and observing. Um, again, to allow for education opportunities. Um, we do, you know, remain with the patient. Um, typically that time, that 15 minutes, we allow that time. It's normally education. And again, just kind of letting everyone know what all this stuff is. Again, reinforcing some of the education as we do try to start our patient education prior to this transition. And um, someone else will kind of speak to some of the education practices. Um, we do then, so once the transition is complete, patient looking good, parameters are looking okay, we do go ahead and place those zip ties in the CPC connectors. Um, and then our patients, while they are in-house with the Freedom Driver, we do keep them on um, continuous SPR2 telemetry monitoring as kind of a, an awareness and a tool um, for just clinical, you know, if no one's in the room with them, um, you know, if something was to be observed or go awry. Um, we do keep them in about a week after transition before they um, are able to go home, typically sometimes longer even. Um, some things that we've kind of learned in the different um, times of transition, um, we have had to obviously tweak our beat rates depending on, you know, their their outputs and such. Um, sometimes we do see that we have to go ahead and just program them five beats greater. Um, and I mentioned, you know, mimicking some of the driver settings days prior to transition. We do leave a suit, their C2 driver in the room for the first 24 to 48 hours just for easy transition back if we need it. Um, otherwise, our backup drivers are in a public space in close proximity to their patient rooms if needed. Um, we reiterate during this time and use this time to practice the zip ties in a controlled setting um, because we do reiterate with staff and patients and caregivers to be very diligent and purposeful when removing and replacing zip ties related to the springs. Um, and then after we place our zip ties, we have kind of had multiple avenues of um, our patients have difficulty with the zip ties and breaking down on their skin. Um, so we do have a quick release um, dressing that we place over top and we do ensure and make sure that it's something quick release. I've had patients um, make um, Velcro or 
um, a fabric, something, but otherwise it's like a paper tape wrap gauze, something with quick entry if needed for emergencies. Um, so that's our general process and thoughts. Any other questions? There's, um, Catherine, there's a couple questions that came up about how you clinically monitor your patients with the biomarkers for LDH and TEGS. Um, can, can you speak to a little bit more why you use both or why you use TEG over LDH monitoring? So we um, have just our standard, um, actually looked at just specifically our LDH and trended those. Um, there are occasions where they will get tags um, in the beginning, um, but that's not a routine for us any um, longer, but with our just um, watching the hemolysis uh, with our LDs and they do, you know, making sure that they're not, um, that they're trending in the general direction, not extremist. Got it. So would you say you use your tags to help um, how much aspirin or other antiplatelet regimens that you're using to? In, in initiation is when we would use those, when we're initiating those. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, Shauna, you wanna, um, Catherine, you can stop sharing. Shauna, can you go ahead and then share your screen? Word for word. We can see you. You're still muted though. You're still muted, sweetie. Yeah. There. I just it changed my little thingy, moved up to the top, and I was having a hard time getting the thing to pop down on the screen. Sorry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching. Um, <clears throat> Catherine had some of the points that I briefly mentioned in here, so I don't mean to step on her toes, but just to reiterate that I think we all pretty much have a lot of similarities in here. So going from there, um, we're just going to talk about freedom driver discharge teaching. <clears throat> Let me get the big screen here. There we go. All right. So we, like Catherine, start with some show and tell at the beginning. So prior to, you know, patients going on TH, uh, one of the things that we do introduce is the freedom driver and that it is noisy, but it does get people out of there. So when we're doing our 101, as we call it here, our introduction, um, we do show it. We take our little training freedom driver up. So <laughs> sometimes I'm not sure if that's good, but we don't want, we've also had the experience of patients being unpleasantly surprised by what it looks like, what it sounds like, and all that sort of stuff. And like Catherine, we moved to you know similar settings on uh, our freedom when or with our C2 before we moved to the default freedom settings. And we've basically adopted the pressures on the C2 of left is 200, right is 100, and vacuum is minus 13 or 14 before we move over. Those are uh, the pressure settings are consistent throughout their C2 time, unless there's some particular reason to change that. Um, introduction to the freedom. Uh, we try and talk with the patients. I think a lot of our teaching, or at least what I'm going to talk about today, is some of just the psychological adjustment and, and talking with the patients and sharing the ideas and the advantages. So we talk to them and we do warn them. Some of them don't really care. Some care a lot. I've had patients say, I didn't understand or you didn't tell me, you know, I was going to be, that it was going to be different. Other people afterwards were like, maybe you shouldn't have told me because now I don't have those and I don't know if it's right or wrong. So <laughs> right or wrong, we do try and share with the fact that at least the patient should know it is going to feel different for some people and that it's unique to everybody. So our first freedom patient who was actually one of the little uh, Syncardia folks who did his big 602 miles between uh, TAH and transplant was talking about how it, he just stood there and he was very quiet. And then he said, it feels like bees in my chest. 
So ever since then, I've always been very acutely aware of how that makes a difference to the patients for how that's feeling in there. Some people, I've had one person who I wasn't even sure if she was like really with us because she just was so in tune to her body and how it felt so differently that she was just like inward all the way. And I was like, wait, come back, come back. So, and then some don't notice much difference at all. So rather than even explain those things, I just try and talk about how it's going to be different. So they're at least a little bit aware of that and that it's not a total surprise. And then we always talk about the positive parts and the reason and the good reasons for going on freedom is besides going home is that it's easier to get around, you can get to the bathroom, you have a little more independence, it's easy for PT to work with the patients and they can shower once they're on freedom. We do try and desensitize uh, by bringing up the equipment ahead of time. If we don't have our discharge kit in yet, uh, we just bring up the practice freedom driver, battery charger, two batteries, and um, an adapter and their emergency bracelet and have them start getting used to wearing that. We leave the practice equipment in the room and we introduce them to what all those contents and what those things are. And if they're interested, you know, right away, then we can start talking about it. If they want to just sort of start thinking about it, that's fine. We allow plenty of time either before their transition or after before they're discharged. Sometimes patients will acclimate, acclimate <clears throat> and be fine when we start doing teaching and hands-on. Some of them start imagining the worst of things that could happen and they come up with all sorts of possibilities. And then they're greatly relieved when we do the teaching and hear uh, how, th how things go. Uh, we had one person who was just like, every time I turned around, she was like, I, I always thought it was going to be way worse than that. And I'm like, okay, you're just going to hear everything I have to say until <laughs> you come up with something I don't have to say. Um, one person thought we were actually kicking him out because we introduced the freedom driver to him. And I was like, no, 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 no. We're just trying to introduce the idea and the process. And so I try and be very explicit with folks these days when we're introducing and moving on towards Freedom Driver. And we're doing more of that ahead of time. We leave the dis Syncardia Discharge Manual with the patient and the caregivers, and I've had people read it front to back, and they know all of the answers by the time we sit down and do the Syncardia test together. Um, and that way I can answer questions and go over things in there, and we sort of skip over some of the questions and I'm going to start coming up with our own that doesn't have some of those in there. Um, and we've taught as many as one person at a time or as many as six. Um, one time I had a brother and a sister who were swapping out care of their father. Um, he had come down from Alaska. The son was up there. The sister was in New Zealand. She came over he was coming down, so she was going to leave, and he was arriving the same day, but he hadn't had any training, so we ended up doing it um, on FaceTime. That was interesting. Um, and then, like I said, we go through all the manual questions. As a group, I know that they're not all answering it, but then I do make them go out and answer and put in their little uh, answers in the sheet, and we collect all of their tests. The important part is practice and that they can demonstrate with us. So first we demonstrate with them how to change it with two people, that whole process, beginning to end, we start with the basics and then we expand. Um, and we have some people who are very adept at this. One husband who's totally on top of it, I was like, you're ready to teach other patients. He could, uh, he demonstrated to us how he could change on his own if he didn't have his wife to help him. That was great that he knew how to do that and that he could show us that. Um, and then we leave the practice freedom driver in the room or just out in the hall so that they can practice at any time. Of course, some of the stuff that's included in the practice besides those things are checking the batteries when they're not in the charger, um, how to put the zip ties in, how to make sure that it's okay when you go to do a change that you can press the button. Um, a lot of those little detail things that are very important. Um, and then we provide them with signage about no chest compressions so that those ugly things don't happen out in the community. So they have one, several car in their apartment or their home. We try and demonstrate the alarms as much as we can uh, because they're so dang loud and so that they're not completely phased, uh, incapacitated when they hear one of those things. So it's easy to do the battery ones, you know, when we've got the freedom driver 
Uh, we can do the fault one. That's not too hard to do. Some of the other ones we've tried to simulate and record when we can, and we try and play some of those when we can, like a temperature alarm. Um, and then we, of course, go over all of the alarms and the scenarios, and we just use the Syncardia alarm review. Some of the things, so this is the pretty sort of different version. I take out some of the wordage that Syncardia uses, sorry, Syncardia, um, and just make it a little bit easier. Um, I just call a battery a battery so that it's a little bit clearer for some folks. And then we just basically go over all of these and discuss them. And, you know, most patients are pretty good about this. We've had one who forgot what the temperature alarm was, but she'd been on so long, she didn't even know that there was such a thing anymore. So she ended up changing out her freedom driver. <laughs> and then she's like, I recorded it. I'm like, great, share your recording. Now I can share it with other patients. Um, they get a copy of this, of course, on what the CPC connectors are, how those zip ties go in there, and how to make a quick release, or how to change that over. We also share with them the little video that Syncardia has on using a wire tie. And it's uh, part of the staff education in our PowerPoint presentation and in our re-education on a yearly basis. I don't think this wants to advance because the movie, oh, there we go. How to change the freedom driver. We have the caregiver present. So when we're ready to actually do the change like Catherine was talking about, we have the caregiver present. We have other staff who want to be included in that. Um, particularly, I think the APPs who are here 24 seven really like to be around when we do that, in case they're called upon or so that they know what that process is. So whenever we do that, it's definitely a scheduled thing like Catherine was talking about and we'll have as many people in there as want to be. We warn them, like Catherine said, about the alarms that are gonna happen when we switch. Uh, and we've enlisted people so they can get used to doing some of those things to help silence those alarms as quickly as possible. We do put the Freedom Driver in its backpack on an IV pole. It's not very elegant and it doesn't sound very sophisticated, but it works. Um, and our very first patient that was in the news, we wheeled down to his little um, <clears throat> his little news conference, and then he had his backpack up on his pole, and he had his backup done on the wheelbase uh, attached to the pole so that it was always with him. When we do this, it just allows for them to get around so much easier. All they have to do is plug in and unplug. They can go to the bathroom. They can go do PT stuff. You know, once they have a trained caregiver, they can actually get around more. And there are times when people have gotten out quick enough, they're not even independent with like a care uh, with their backpack and uh, able to use that. And they'll go home, we'll actually let them go home with an IV pole. Or if they're ready, they at least have a few suitcase carriers they can put them on. <laughs> um, this is just the signage that we put up in the inpatient rooms for the staff so they're not confused about what they need to do at the time of a change. We did just have a recent change that went very quickly. I wasn't even up there. They were already done. So there's definitely some staff that had become pretty proficient. We do it all the time every year. We, it's one of the things that has uh, gone over in our yearly education. And then we also teach and show how to do showering. Our occupational therapy group does this. They're really good. Uh, the nursing staff is getting a little bit more proficient at it as they see more of it. And courtesy of CEDARS, we use their protocol and built on it for a job aid. And then this is just some of the stuff that we teach the staff. And that's around in the room when the patients are on freedom. So they always have some sort of a reference. So this is just our two page once, you know, startup information for a quick review. And them's my, them's my words, any questions? I was talking quick, wasn't I? You did good. That's awesome. Okie dokie. I think that um, there's only really one question about the, do you use a, um, a demo or a teaching freedom driver with the patients? I know that they use Definitely. That, um, most centers do have one that they use and we certainly can provide them. Um, so that you can use to teach your patients. Yeah, they're essential. Anything else? Anyone else? 
Oh, I was going to say to Catherine, we use the black Velcro covers on the drive lines that send Cardia sends to cover up around the zip ties. Those tend to work for some of the patients. And Does anybody um, for, use securing devices or anchors on the drive lines? Um, actually, uh, we use the um, uh, soft restraints uh, for adult or actually the neonate. Um, yeah soft wrist restraint and it's actually work because it's softer and um, sure. it has that quick release um, that um, Catherine was talking about. Okay. All right, shut up. You want to unshare and then Mel will go. Okay. To you once. There we go. Okay. Let me see where it's my stuff. Sorry, hang on just a sec. Thought I had it up. All right. Can you guys see it? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Mine is short and sweet, and um, I just want to put up our picture out there so you see our team right there, although I'm losing two of them. Um, but I'm here to talk about the discharge process, the community prep. Um, uh, I am only two slides, very short. So like uh, Catherine and Shauna was saying, um, once, you know, we... Uh, are getting close to the setting that we are happy with to switch them out. We order the kit um, ahead of time um, and then transfer them and keep them in the hospital for a week just so we have all the, um, so it helps actually to keep the patient comfortable with the Freedom Driver and then we start training. Um, about 24 to 48 hours after they transition because we find that the patients are patients i don't know if catherine or anybody else out there when they switch them to freedom they feel like there's a difference in how they feel and they don't they feel like their chest is coming out of their uh the heart is coming out of their chest after we switch them which is very odd um so we kind of wait until they settle down and then we start to teach and then, um, just so you guys know our process, uh, our pharmacist also schedule a teach with them for the medication. The dietitian goes over the uh, diet uh, that would be affecting their Coumadin. And then social workers, uh, we have a patient caregiver contract uh, that we actually um, implemented for the TAH and now implemented it for our LVAD. It's just to go over again the, you know, the requirements that we require of the caregiver because they tend to forget all that once we um, implant, such as the 24-hour caregiver um, availability and the teaching and everybody else, uh, like a uh, backup caregiver. And then, um, you know, simultaneously, we will also prepare the community. We go out to the community to, um, especially the local ER and EMS, um, to just give them a brief um, background on the patient, what to do in case of an emergency, um, especially the hemoglobin, um, you know, how they panic. They come in for a nosebleed and they see the hemoglobin and they, they tend to just always um, transfuse. And as you know, we try to limit the transfusion because of the um, elevation of uh, PRAs. Um, and you know, the usual electric company and um, provide also in services to their cardiologist if they want to see them in their primary care physician as well, if they request um, us to come. The other thing we do uh, post-discharge is obviously the clinic. I don't know if someone's going to talk about clinic visit, but I'm going to just uh, quickly, like what we learned throughout the, we've discharged about 42 patients on Freedom over the course of the years that we've implanted. Um, and we see them, the most we don't see them is four weeks a month. Um, but 
uh, we see them weekly for at least two months. Um, and then uh, if we are unsure of, like if they're having a lot of uh, high fills, um, we will bring a C2 to clinic to assess their um, right side uh, volume status as well. And during our change out, our 120 change outs, we actually make the caregiver, uh, for some of them that haven't had experience a, a driver switch out, they will switch out at the time of the change out. Um, and really that's it for me as far as discharge. Um, Pretty easy PC. The only question is um, how many uh, current how many current patients are you following at Cedars? You know what? I'm happy to say we are not following anybody. We've transplanted our last uh, patient who was actually enrolled in the DT trial. He lost weight and got transplanted, and then uh, yeah, he was our last one. With the status two allocation, honestly, they go pretty fast. It's like a week of listing, they go. So that allocation actually truly helped them. We only have one at UW. So we kind of have our uh, life back. <laughs> uh huh. We're by it. Thank you for joining in last minute. Um, uh, and I appreciate you being willing to share your experience. Are you uh, okay to share your slides with us this afternoon? Just, just make sure you unmute yourself too. One more time. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to mute this. So we're having we're little having tech. Little tech. Okay. okay, we're good. All right. So why am I not sharing? Stop doing my screen sharing. Okay. Okay. So can, we're going to talk about uh, discharge home and living with a um, TH at home. I'm sorry. We're trying to get our we have double, double microphones right now. If you're on the phone and your computer. Yes, because the volume is not connecting to our, my computer. Can you mute your computer or mute your phone or one, one of the two you can mute? Okay, how is that? Better. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna be talking about living with a total artificial heart um, and how we get the patient and the caregivers ready to go home um, and feeling comfortable as well as how we, what we do with our community as well as the PTOT um, training that the patients and caregivers receive. Um, I think from, with all of us, we all try and get our TH education started prior to the implant. Uh, that way the patient can feel comfortable after the surgical uh, implantation and they can uh, more readily absorb the fact that they have a total artificial heart right now. So um, the, we start with the hands-on education with the TH. We show them all the drivers um, the, uh, and all the stuff that goes along with it, living with it at home. Um, we do the occupational therapy education, uh, and we also shower our patients. We've always showered our LVADs and our total artificials. Um, we teach the patient and caregivers those. Um, and then we, um, the one thing we do, and I don't know if other centers do, but we do not allow our patients to drive, so they are um, always with their caregivers. So we try and go through that as well. Um, and how they get into the car and we do their outing and we put them in their car and we make sure they're, we teach them how to properly get um, on the car battery um, while uh, traveling through to different appointments and such. Um, we start with the total, the TH workbooks that are both required to be completed by the patient and the caregivers. 
um, as well as uh, sometimes patients learn better with flashcards, we, uh, and we offer those for review um, while they're trying to learn the different pieces of the total artificial. Um, and then we just meet, usually we try daily with the patient and then a few times a week with the family um, to do the work with the workbook, work with the connections, um, just getting them to be comfortable with the equipment, feel what it feels like, feel how heavy it is, um, and teach them how to uh, travel with it and live their daily lives with it. Um, once they've figured out how to, you know, what the device is and how it works and what the workbooks, um, the, when the workbooks are completed, we do give our patients um, a final exam. We've actually made our own from the Syncardia book um, and the families and the care, I'm sorry, the patients and the caregivers are required to complete that. We grade it and then re uh, go over the stuff that they may not feel comfortable with. Um, and then we of course do the emergency driver change out um, while producing alarms if possible. Um, I did ask, I'm not sure, I think it was Shauna who uh, has actual videos of the alarms. Uh, if you'd be willing to share those with our program, that would be awesome. We don't have, we can create them just like we, you can, but if you actually have them, a temperature alarm, something we, like that, we can share with our families and uh, patients. I feel like they would um, be more prepared when the events happen. Um, so we do the final exam and then the emergency driver change out procedure. Um, and we also practice in and out of a car procedure with our occupational therapy. So um, during that period, they obviously get to know us very well and they were continuously reminding them of who to call first, what, if it's a true emergency, 911 then us, or um, if it's a random alarm just to call us first and we walk them through. Um, and then what to do if the freedom driver was to need to be changed out at home. We have actually recently started to give our uh, patients three drivers. That way, I'm, if we all know alarms happen at three in the morning, um, and we usually have to do our freedom driver change outs then, and we found that we were driving in quite often at two, three, four o'clock in the morning to give them a backup freedom driver. So um, after two weekends in a row of our travels, we decided that we would uh, go to three drivers at home. So, and it's, it's helped us in at least one occasion. So, um, we also do community training. Uh, throughout the year, we do our staff training with acute rehab, cardiac rehab, and our nursing centers. But we've also um, have trained EMS on the guidelines, how to, um, have what to do if they do go on these calls um, and they are they do have annual requirements through the state um, that help them with their CEs um, and then we do offer the EMS hands-on training for um, patients that they may go on and if they need to we they have helped us multiple times with the change outs um, and transports of these patients so offering them additional information and education if they wanted it we do offer for them um, we do send letters to them and the closest ER for to let them know that they do have a total artificial in their community and where to what who to call and where to send them if they do get them. Um, we also have trained multiple hemodialysis centers and in our infusion centers for uh, weekly dialysis as well as blood transfusions uh, for our patients. Um, we've provided hands-on training. Luckily, our infusion center is actually located in the hospital, so um, they've definitely been beneficial for us, and we can, if they have questions, we just run down and try and help them feel comfortable with the um, monitoring of our patients and them knowing that they can get to us, um, you know, within minutes, um, helps them feel more comfortable. We also, with the hemodialysis center, we do staff training, uh, we do require the caregiver to be with them on all dialysis runs. Um, and then we will usually go to the dialysis center, uh, you, the first or and possibly the second run, um, 
when the patients are discharged to the dialysis center so they feel comfortable and they understand how the patient's bodies are going to respond to the dialysis um, and it just would be hands-on and they also have our contact numbers where we you know during the dialysis if they have questions we also try and stay in contact with our dialysis centers as far as you know how the patient did what how much volume was taken off and then is there a possibility of renal recovery that maybe the doctor doc conversations can be had that we can help these patients get off the dialysis um, home health has been beneficial. They keep an eye on our patients at home. They call us with blood pressures, uh, concerns from um, abnormal labs, home environments. If the patients are alone and the caregivers have decided to become comfortable and leaving the patients you know, at home, we, we tend to get those calls and we will um, kind of re-educate the family and the patients on the importance of always being with a caregiver and what to happen if uh, they something an emergency did go wrong and and the patient was left alone. Um, and then also, if in the event of an emergency, if they were to be at, with the patient at the time, what to do and who to contact. Um, we haven't had a home health nurse. I don't know if we've trained them for doing an actual drive or change out. We would we would have them uh, call nine one one and we would walk the fire. Through, uh, unless there was a caregiver, of course, we'd use them first. Um, with that said, we were asked to do a patient scenario of what happened um, at, a, at a particular time, and this was all very vivid in our mind. We were all together at one night. Um, when we got a call from a patient uh, caregiver, they had a high priority alarm on the freedom, dri freedom driver that was unable to be cleared. Uh, the patient's caregiver did do the correct thing and they called us immediately. Um, however, the pa patient's caregiver got uh, anxiety, took over and they for actually forgot um, how to change out a, a driver. The, uh, even though the patient's caregiver had done the change outs before, they practiced them with us and they had actually gone through uh, a driver change out at home with the patient when the patient had a prior alarm. Um, but unfortunately, the patient, when they looked at the two ends of the CPC connectors, they looked different and they couldn't figure out that red to red, blue to blue because of the difference in the, um, the connector, with the, the male to female ends were different and they thought they should look the same. So the, the caregiver ended up disconnecting the patient and the patient actually out said, I'm going out, I'm going out, um, and almost and started to pass out. So we had the caregiver connect the patient back to the alarming freedom driver. And we tried to do the change out multiple times. Unfortunately, he was not able to pull himself together. So we ended up having to um, attempt to FaceTime with him and explain the difference of the driver change out. Um, and about 20, 25 minutes into this process, we decided that it, it, he wasn't going to get it and we called the fire department um, and they were, um, EMS came out to assist us. EMS got on the FaceTime with us as well and they were able to successfully transfer the patient to the uh, new Freedom driver without difficulty. They're used to these stressful environments so they could listen to us and uh, calmly get the patient onto the driver. Um, without incident, the patient was fine. Uh, we did ask the EMS to, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, patient and the caregiver to come to the hospital immediately. Obviously, we had to change out the drivers. This is before um, they had the third driver at home. Um, and we also, when they finally came in, um, we reviewed the change out and what, what went wrong. Uh, the dad, or I'm sorry, the caregiver did try to hide from us. However, <laughs> He ended up having to come to the next clinic appointment with the patient where we uh, went over what happened and why it happened and had him re, uh, we re-educated him on the proper procedure of how to do a driver change out. Um, but it was just one of those things when the alarms, I think that's why we asked if you have the videos of the alarms, if we could have those alarms going off or you know, uh, showing the patients what is uh, going on and what they, the these alarms sound like during a change out, they may be able to 
um, have that sense of anxiety and the feeling and still be able to do the train change out during a, a practice um, change out. So any questions? That's a great story. Awesome. That's a humdinger. <laughs> yeah. Not when you're in it. It was great. It's a great teaching tool, but it wasn't a good experience. Oh, that would be very anxiety provoking. Yes. <laughs> um, I just have a, a question. Have you guys um, experienced any uh, fractured drive lines? In Not any of you guys? We have had the springs uh, fall, uh, you know, tip up sideways. Right. Mm -hmm. right. We had to change out our CPC connectors. Um, but other than no fracture driveline. Oh, and we used, uh, we used the rescue tape as well on our drivelines. Just, so for, just for prophylactic or? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, we use a red one and a blue one. So it's on each side. So red, you know, it kind of helps them distinguish if those little red uh, tape pieces fall off, you know which side is red and which side is the blue also. Yeah, gotcha. Mel, I've had two. One that was uh, half, half around, halfway around the tubing. It uh -huh. wasn't an all the way through the tubing, but it was halfway. It wasn't all the way around. It was below mm -hmm. the wire at the natural sort of bend. We uh, started protecting it with like perfusion tubing to hold it stiff at that natural bend point. Yeah. And then I had one that was a little tiny one underneath the. Uh, um, underneath CPC. a zip tie and it was so small and and syncardia was like how's it doing i'm like i don't go exploring it it will reveal itself <laughs> if need be <laughs> i'm not going to aggravate the situation it ain't broke yet <laughs> right yeah those were actually the things that uh kept us up um when we were on call those fractures you had some zingers though yep i uh, i think i've had two or three in one between midnight and three in the morning, believe it or not. <laughs> I believe that's it, because that's usually when you have to do the scary driver change up too. Right. That are on a weekend. Exactly. Wait, I swear they wait for the weekend at nighttime. It's never during the day or during the week. <laughs> oh. Because they change their driveline dressings at two or four in the morning, you know. That's oh yeah, doesn't everybody <laughs> do all kinds of things? We had one patient drop his driver. He was oh, trying yeah. to mm -hmm. put it up on his shoulder, and it came flying out of the back because it wasn't really in there. And it's like he showed up with this gap, and I was like, oh, 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 oh. scaring oh, me. Oh yeah, no, I know. I I mean, Steve can sh tell you stories from our center, um, drivers that are cracked open because yeah, they dropped them that. and still functioning still fine. fine it's amazing yes. oh yeah yes it's just the case yeah mm -hmm. and we had that one patient change out his driver by himself oh lord yeah <laughs> <laughs> is that a chicken and an egg thing like when heartmate had the pump hand pump yes the hand pump yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> that yeah of course i didn't know this at the time he told me this after he got transplanted uh, I told him, yeah, God, dear God. That's fun to ask patients after they're transplanted. What did you, what rules did you break or what did you not oh, share yeah. at the time? Oh, they were driving too. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Okay. We had recently one patient who went in for a clinic visit. And as he started his visit, he got a low battery alarm realized he did not bring the battery and any extra batteries and did not bring the charger to plug into the wall, didn't have a car charger in his car. So I don't remember which one of you four presenters said that was one of the first things you did is you asked them when they arrived for a clinic visit, did you bring your backup batteries power supply? Oh. Yeah, no, we had, I told you, we had that one patient that went shopping and didn't have anything. And they called 911 and 911 was like, where am I going to take him? I said, take him home. <laughs> <laughs> take him to his supplies, wherever they may be. 
exactly. Yeah, we had a patient um, show up and I was like, where's your, I need, you're at like end of the battery. We have to change out the driver. What am I supposed to do? I'm like, never mind. I'll be back in a minute. I had to go get AC, put it anyway. Yeah. I like the lack of supplies. But there's a question from the, um, the group, someone's in Florida where they face hurricane seasons. Um, in case of natural disasters, what is like your disaster plan? So like they get the hurricanes, so would they advise patients coming to the hospital as part of their disaster preparedness? Yeah. So for us, you know, we don't have, luckily, we don't have hurricanes, but we do have earthquakes and fires. Um, so what we tell our caregivers is if, you know, um, earthquakes, unfortunately, we don't have warnings, but if they can't get to our hospital, we tell them to go and grab all their emergency equipment and go to a hotel or a friend who um, is nearby and not affected by the um, disaster. Or if we can get to them, then we, we will admit. That is if the hospital is still standing too during an earthquake. So um, that's what we do for us. So Bill, if you don't mind, I just jump in from the Florida thing. This is Elizabeth for anybody that can't see me. Um, for the person who's in Florida, there is a Florida VAD coordinators group on Facebook. I'm, you, you may or may not be aware of it, but I, I've noticed that with the past couple of big, scary hurricanes that have come through, um, there's a lot of communication on that website because it's not only TAH patients, also your VAD patients. They you know, make preparation. And there's a really nice guy in Brunswick, Georgia, I believe is where he is, who's always volunteering his time, his people, uh, and his advice to say, listen, if, you, if your people are evacuating north, here's our contact information, et cetera, et cetera. But if, if you're not part of that group, I would, I would get on that Facebook group because it's just a wealth of information. Yeah, we always teach to the VAD and TH that they have to have some sort of a plan to go somewhere. And I said, you can't just show up at a fire station. Not everybody's actually welcome at all fire stations. Um, you need to check it out or have a generator or a place that you're going to go. Like, a, like you said, somebody who's not affected or, to some, or a shelter or something. How many, how many batteries does everybody send home with the patients? We only send them with six. Yeah. Yeah, same here. We do six. Yeah, we do six. Four is never enough. No. And we frequently will do three drivers, two backups, for the same reason as <laughs> Mel. Oh, yeah, always two. Uh, yeah. You need to have Too quality of enough. life of the coordinator. I know. <laughs> well, well we actually, it gives them a peace of mind because they know that they're right. not just going to be having one and that they then right. like, like oh, we don't have a backup until we go get it. So right. it is well, actually helpful. Yeah, that's until your, your patient decides to prep ahead of time and put the backup driver, his second backup driver, in the car and the car gets stolen. Oh! <laughs> it's like when that, bad Steve? patients leave their backup equipment in the car and the bag gets stolen because it looks like a right. lovely camera bag. Right, exactly. Right, Steve? You remember that? The guy who yeah, lived like right. two hours away from our center and, you know, Murphy's Law, he yeah. halted and he doesn't have a backup. And I'm like, oh, shit. Oh God! <laughs> I mean, Evans oh my God! Murgatroyd. This is Judy. I don't remember that one at all, Mel. I'm. I don't know. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> no. Oh shit, Judy. That might be a good thing. <laughs> really? I I for, I don't know why you don't know that. Because I mean, it would. We had to replace it. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> That's good. I'm sure I told you all that it was stolen. Because we couldn't get return it. Nobody ever returned it. Mel, speaking to that, um, any insurance issues for these patients in the trial when you had these issues, or were they 
out on their actual rentals with um, you? Well, you know, during the clinical trial, obviously, Syncardia provided the freedom drivers. But once we were out of the clinical trial, it was some challenge. But obviously, Syncardia was very helpful uh, transitioning us to find a, a DME. Um, orthodynamics was very helpful in the beginning with us, um, transitioning all our uh, patients uh, when we went from clinical trial to the commercial use. But it's kind of odd because, I mean, they're really just a middleman, right? Because you get all the drivers, you just report to them um, the serial numbers because it, they're all were shipped to us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, it's going on four o'clock. Um, I, I don't oh, want to, wow. yeah, I, I, you guys have been great. And um, I don't want to hold anybody up that has to get back to clinic or anything like that either. Um, I'm going home. For you. You go, Mel. <laughs> I'm tired of this place. If anybody has any other questions um, at the clinical community or our internal team, just report to the local clinical and we'll get you in touch with whoever presented their section today with questions. Thank you everyone for being available. Thanks Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Steve, are you hosting this meeting? All right, so if you turn off record and you put yourself off of mute, and if we end up being alone, I'll talk to you, otherwise I'll call you.